condition. And so there's often tension and conflict where that is concerned. Very briefly, let me just tell you about some of the recent situations that I've had to deal with. Um, several where there's been leaders that have fallen into moral disrepair. One fairly recent where a, a, a ministry colleague had had an extramarital affair and there's a pregnancy as a result of that. You can't imagine how complicated those situations become. One even closer to home was a, a man that had had an extramarital affair. Um, he strayed, he and his wife were reconciled. Uh, the third party was called in, there was some kind of conciliation that took place. Um, the lady, the third party, then allured him or enticed him, I'm not sure what the right word is, seduced him back again. And in that visit, there'd been an encounter with the two of them. She then gathered the DNA, went down to the local police station, laid a charge of rape against them. The case went to court, and he's serving 10 years in prison. The consequences. I got to meet this family. And now you're having to deal with a family where it's all, the, all, the, all the strife is there. And the brother-in-law brings the wife, brings his sister, you know, the brother-in-law of the family, and he brings the two children. And he says, can you please help this family because the father has to report to Marmersbury Prison on Friday and start a 10-year term for this thing that, has been, that he's been accused of. It's brokenness. As soon as I get home, I'm going to have to look up a, a young woman in our church. And she's just had a horrendous, I'm not going to share the details of it with you, but just had a horrendous background. And after many, many episodes of of depression, and I won't share the details of how that came about, but just years and years of abuse and neglect has now had another breakdown, and she's now had a, a situation where memory has been blocked off. The last memory she has, she has two children, both of them from men that were shot in gang warfare. Uh, the one is a seven-year-old boy, the other is a 16-year-old boy, and, and her last memory that she has is when the second father was shot dead. Everything from that point all the way through to the modern time has been wiped out. Family brokenness. Great, great trauma. And we struggle with the curse of sin. And so therefore we need massive doses of God's grace. And I tell you there's no other place to go but to flee to the cross, isn't there? Where else do you go but to have access to the, to the very throne of grace? You know, you and I, we can, we can face and overcome some of the smaller challenges in family and married lives. But I want to say this to you, that when we have severe conflict that causes such great trauma, that it's pleasing to God that we flee to Him, and it does bring delight back to us. And so with everything I said, I want to narrow this down and really say, how in the family do you find grace in the midst of conflict? I wanted to go to Philippians 4, and then I realized that I spoke about, don't turn to Philippians 4, that's not my passage. I realized that I spoke about Philippians 4 at length a year ago this time because a memory popped up on Facebook and said to me last year this time I did Philippians 4. So I'm going to go to a different passage. I, sh I shared much about that in my testimony last time. But for today I've chosen to go to Ephesians chapter 4. So why don't you go there with me? And here's my question. I want to ask you as we look at Ephesians 4, a couple of verses, we'll pick it up at verse 17. But as we look at Ephesians 4 today, I want you to ask yourself, have you had family conflict? How far back do you have to think in order to remember when last you've had some kind of conflict situation? I can say to you, I don't have to think too far back. Uh, maybe Sunday morning, um, maybe even more recently. I often struggle with patience and I blame I have a wife and a daughter, and getting ready on a Sunday morning can often be a source of great displeasure. I get done fairly quickly, and it doesn't matter what time we agree to leave, um, inevitably there's a waiting period for some poor pastor who wants to get to church and his family are just not ready. And so I'd sit in the car and tap my fingers and... Eventually, I'd force myself to read a psalm because there's so much anger and resentment that I'm afraid that if they got into the car, I'd probably explode and say the wrong thing before I have to go and preach. So I'm saying this to you, and I'm keeping that in mind as I do this. We've all had our moments of family feuds, and I want to spend the rest of my time speaking about family conflicts. Well, 
Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let me simply. And give no let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here's a wonderful chapter that absolutely brims with just much important practical biblical truth. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to just climb right into it because you notice how as you listen to the passage it just begins to intensify. He says, uh, you know, you did not learn from Christ in this way. You know, if indeed you've heard from him, you've been taught in him just as truth in Jesus. And then the next couple of verses, <coughs> pardon me, are just stacked with truth, one truth upon the other. And I want you to think about how in our conflict situations we can draw from some of the things that we read here. Well, here's the key in the text. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. How does that impact on conflicts? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moments, that it will do what? So that it will give grace. There's the key to the passage. Think about the last conflict that you've had. And you can simply apply that right there. So that it will give grace to those who hear. Let the words that you speak give grace to those who hear what you say. And then he warns you why you ought to do that. He says, do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and so on. And he goes on to complete that for you. Well, my topic is really about feuding families, resolving conflicts. So I want to unpack it under three headings. I have the horrid reputation of point one being this long, and then point two this long, and point three that long. But bear with me, there are three points. It's not pointless. The first is, what is the determination of, biblical, of, of, of conflict resolution? What must be the, the, the focus, the goal, the lens of conflict resolution? Secondly, I want to speak about what is the very heart of conflict resolution and then thirdly, where's the power of conflict resolution? All right, I'll repeat them as we go. So here's what happens. You have conflict in your household. The temperature begins to rise. Blood pressures go up. Things begin to flare. Here's the question. What's the determination? What's the thing that you must have in mind? It has to be a sincere desire to want to change yourself. I don't know if you know the book by Ken Sandy, The Peacemaker Seminar. It's an excellent work on biblical peacemaking. And he speaks about the four G's of conflict resolution. And the first G is glorify God. The second G is get the log out of your own eye. What kind of self-examination needs to take place in order to ensure that I've not contributed to the conflict in the first place? What is, it that I, what is it that I may have said, that I may have done, that has escalated the conflict? Let no unwholesome speech come out of your mouth. Tim Chester, in his book, I, 
Um, it's available. I think Billy's got copies of it over there. You can change as an excellent piece of work on how you and I can change. There's got to be a desire in our hearts to want to change. And I'm going to say something about how we do that. Because he speaks about the transforming power of God, you know, for our sinful behavior and for our negative emotions. How can our sinful habit patterns be broken? How can our negative emotions be, be turned around? How can we respond in a different way? And that's the most important question to ask when the heat is rising, when there's conflict in a household, when a small group of people who love each other, presumably, who live together in a confined space, what do you do when the, when the heat is rising? You have to ask yourself, what is my goal right now? What is it that, that my determination should be right now? What is it in my determination that God can bless at this time? There's got to be a determination about that. Paul warns in Galatians 6 and verse 7 that do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. In other words, have I adopted a wrong goal during this time of my conflict? Have I taken the wrong determination? Have I moved in the right direction? Have I put myself in a position where I'm acting against the plan and against the purposes of God? Is my determination dishonoring to God? Are the things that I'm wanting in, wanting to win this argument, in wanting to overcome in this conflict, is that dishonoring to God? It's very easy to think about a situation, and maybe I'll just refer very quickly to what Paul is saying in, in Philippians 4. I said this a year ago, but for some of you that haven't, haven't seen or heard that, when Paul addresses the situation with these two women that are there, in Philippians 4, there's two women having a conflict, and he says, I plead with you, Syntyche and Euodia, to be at peace with one another. And obviously the verse that you all know so well, I'm sure you can all quote Philippians 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now most of us think that's some kind of nice praise chorus that you sing when you're feeling happy. Not. It's in the midst of Paul realizing that these folks are in conflict with one another. There's a disagreement. And Paul says he, he knows that the one thing that goes when there's conflict is joy. You cannot give glory to God. And he goes on to say, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. It's interesting what he follows with. He says, and then the peace of God which passes all understanding will be your portion. Think on these things, whatever's pure and noble and upright and praiseworthy. Now, why does Paul say that? Because when there's conflict, that's the last place that we go to. The last thing that we're thinking of is giving glory to God. The first thing I want to do when somebody annoys me is I want to go and thump them and tell them how they've hurt me. You want to go up to them and show them how they've wronged you and point out their sin. Well, what you see in the scripture is something exactly different. You know, you can't. You know, are you, have you put yourself into a situation where you've adopted the wrong determination? You know, during a time of conflict, you put yourself in a position where you're acting against the direction that God wants you to go. And there's no way that I can expect God to bless my sinful actions. There's no way I can expect God to, to, to bless my attitudes when my behavior is dishonoring to Him. Why? Because God will not be mocked. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Several years ago, I'd been speaking at a marriage conference, and uh, we were on our way home. We drove home from Villiersdorp. It's about 140 kilometers from Cape Town. She says to me, honey, <coughs> I'm, uh, I don't feel like making supper. Can we, can we just get some burgers or something on the way? So I said, fine. So I call her head to Steers, and I order burgers for us, and uh, I drop her at home. I drive down to Steers to pick it up. And as I leave Steers, I leave the parking lot, and I drive into the main road, but I stop at the stop street, and there's a microbus busy making a U-turn in, in, in the middle of the intersection. And as he's making the U-turn, he's, he's going very slowly. He's going to eat my car, the front of my car. And my daughter says to me, Dad, you should back up. So I don't answer because I know I'm not in the wrong. I'm standing behind the stop street. He's in the wrong. 
And so he, and he can see me. I can see this man peering over the wheel because he's trying to see the front of my car. And he comes past, and I don't back up, and the man comes past the front of my car, and his microbus clips the front of my car, scratches the whole front, and then he drives down the road. So guess what happens? The blood pressure goes up. I hit the first gear, swung to the left, chased the man down the road, and of course he pulls into a filling station about 200 meters further on, and he just ambles out of his car. He's walking into the, into the cafe on the, on the forecourt, and I leap out of my vehicle, and I said to him, is that the right thing to do? That was my tone. And the man said, sorry, was that you down the road there? Did you not realize that it's not right to hit a man's car and drive away? That was my tone. At that moment, one of the elders of our church happened to be nearby. And he'd seen the incident. So he rushes into the police station, and he's got another policeman who's, who happens to be filling gas into their vehicle by the collar. And he brings the policeman across, and he says, I know this man. He's a pastor in our church, and that man is involved in a hit-and-run accident. Arrest that man. And I looked at him. And I looked at this poor little man, and I looked at my daughter sitting in the car. And my daughter had her head down, shaking her head like this. <laughs> and I'd known that I'd blown it. And all I did was I turned to James, and I said to James, I said, James, let it go. No, 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 pastor, we're going to sort this thing out. I said, James, let it go. I said, do me a favor. I said, sir, just can you just, the team just sort it out. I said, get his number. I'll speak to him on Monday. James spoke to the man. I got in the car, drove home. Silent treatment I got from my daughter. Drove home. I'm looking for the comfort of my wife. I walk into the household with a bag of, 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 the, of, the, of the burger buns, and I said to her, Honey, you won't believe what happened. I tell Trish, she hears Talia's door slam. I tell Trish, and she bursts out laughing. She said, You deserve it. No sympathy. So I'm feeling sorry for myself. So I go to my office, and I pull out my message that I'm preaching the next day. And I'm preaching at a church, thankfully not at our church, but somewhere else. And I'm preaching on Second Peter, where Peter speaks about add to your faith. And then he gives you a whole list of things. Long-suffering, patience, kindness, uh, brotherly affection. And as I went through that list, I thought, <clears throat> how many of those could I tick? In fact, how many of them could I put a cross next to? And then it said, if these things are present and increasing in you, you'll not be fruitless and there's two words he used, and I forget the other word. But he says, but you'll not be fruitless. And it strikes me that I've blown it. And this is my message for the next day. I picked up the phone, and I called that man. And I said to him, Mr. McCallum, his name was McCallum. I said, Mr. McCallum, it's Neil Henry. He said, I said, I'll pay. I said, no, no, that's not the issue. No, 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 I admitted I'm wrong. I said, that's not the issue. Can I say to you, sir, that I'm, I'm sorry, but I was wrong. I was rude, and I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. Oh, okay. And he hung the phone up. I preached to the other church the next morning, and I told them what I'd done. I confessed my sin. I said to them that I'd blown it the night before, and I shared that illustration with them. I get home. James calls me. He says, Pastor, guess who was in our service this morning? Mr. McCall. For some reason, he was touched by my calling him. And he decided to visit our service. He's never been to our church. He lives in the same road where our church is, but he'd never been to our service. And he came and visited our service. Could you imagine what would have happened if I stepped into the pulpit while that man was sitting there? How much credibility would I have had in ministering to him or speaking to him? And you know, you suddenly realize that God is not going to be mocked. What are some of the wrong goals and determinations? Of course I was wronged. Of course there was damage to my car. Of course I'm sorry doesn't fix broken cars. But is there not another thing that we could adopt in a time of conflict? Well, what are some of the wrong goals? What are some of the wrong determinations? And you can hear how my mind works when these things happen. Here's one of the things that we do in times of conflict. And this is why conflict can be such a fire pot of disaster for many of us. Sometimes we have the attitude that we have to win at all costs. We have to win at all costs. 
I don't have this great physique because I've been a couch potato. This has taken a lot of hard work. I played rugby, Donovan. I know it doesn't seem possible now, but there's a great physique hidden underneath this physique. But I trained as a rugby forward. I, I played in the tight five. Those of you that know rugby, that's the, that's the, the five that's scrum down. The front rankers, the hooker, and the, two, and the two locks. I was a lock. I wore a number five on my back. That was my jersey number. And our coach trained us that, and, and you know, they always say that, that the tight five are the thickest bunch in the rugby team. Uh, I don't believe that. I mean, I'm evidence that that's not true, I hope. But here's what would happen is in the training, you trained that when you get the ball, there's only one thing you must do. You drive forward. The try line is there. That's the direction that you go. And the rest of you, the other four of the tight five, come alongside of you, and you form what is called a loose ruck, and you drive the one with the ball forward. It's a winning at all costs. And woe betide any player from the opposing team who happens to land under your feet. Because you're winning at all costs and you will trample on others in order to get to your goal. You have a determination, that's where I want to go to. Actually, what often would happen is some of your own players will trip up and land up under your boots. But you walked over them in order to make sure that the ball went forward. It was a winning at all costs kind of mentality. And so folks who have that kind of mentality when there's a conflict, that's exactly what they do. They berate people. They badger people. They argue. They threaten. They do whatever it takes to make sure that they pound the other person into submission. It's a winning at all costs kind of mentality. There's no way that such a kind of individual would ever admit that they're at fault. I don't know if you watch rugby. Those Grootmanner, those big men, when the referee blows them up for doing something wrong, what do they do? Um, they never did anything wrong. I tell you, I'd be the first one to argue with the ref that I didn't do, Mr. Ref, you need new glasses. You don't admit that you're wrong. That mentality often enters into the way in which we deal with our conflicts. There's no way that person listens carefully. They don't listen to the other person's concerns. There's no way they're going to make some kind of appropriate compromise. They are going to win. They're just going to win. That's their determination any time that a conflict arises. By the way, some Christian husbands act that way under the guise of being leaders. In the home, that kind of man uses his strength and he imposes himself upon his family in this supposed role of being a loving husband and he intimidates his wife. And when we have that situation, we'd often say to, to such, the, such wives in the church, if you ever feel that your husband is intimidating you, physically throwing objects around, you know, sighing, blocking the door, not allowing you to feel safe in your own home, here's what you do. You call the police and the deacons and he'd better pray that the police get there first. You see, whatever determination that we have when we do that, it's not pleasing to God. It's dishonoring to the Lord. Some go to the other extreme. They just absolutely hate conflict. And so they don't like to even communicate or they, 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 they simply just agree with what the other person says. They hope that they'll just keep quiet long enough to sweep it under the carpet. They avoid an argument. They avoid a disagreement. Uh, they're the kind of ones that when there's an issue to be addressed, I don't know if you've seen the cartoon of the man that says the success of his marriage for 50 years, he said it's been two words, yes, dear. You know, problems are never solved. And generally what you have is a low-grade bitterness that just begins to grow. Why? Because that anger becomes internalized and over time it begins to ferment and it becomes a root of bit bitterness springing up, causing trouble, and by many, by it, many are defiled. It becomes a root of bit bitterness. That is why you have so many young people today that say, we don't want to get married. We see the model that's out there. 
We see couples feuding. We see husband and wife that are, that are beating each other or we see this cold war that goes on there. And if that's what marriage is, I don't want to be married. I don't want to get into any kind of relationship like that because that's all they ever see. But notice how the verse begins. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. You see, when my determination is that, that I'm going to win at any cost, I'm going to pound this person into submission, submission, you know what we do? We forfeit the opportunity for the grace of God. When that's the attitude, we miss that. When we give in, you know, I'm not going to try and solve this. I'm not going to try and communicate um, about this thing in any way. You forfeit the grace of God. Winning at all costs is a wrong determination. Giving in is a wrong determination. Here's a third one. So we simply clam up. That's where the person says, I just refuse to talk about it. I'm going to give you the cold shoulder. I'm going to give you the silent treatment. Everyone's going to see that I'm mad and I'm just going to have my little, little pity party. I'm just going to do my little, little drama queen thing right here. You know? And, and I'll make sure that nothing goes on. Nothing's going to be discussed. Nothing's going to be resolved until I have my way. You know, I served under a leader like that for a number of years who would have his little drama queen parties. And he'd cause great offense when he did that. He'd, he'd upset many. He'd cause offense to many. And then he'd keep quiet for a few days. He'd avoid you. He won't want to talk about it. You'll try and approach him and he says, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And then finally one day he'll just walk in, and he did that often, where he'd just walk into my office, open the door, and he says, Mr. Henry, that issue, it's over, eh? And he closes the door, and for him it's a done deal. And I tell you, the amount of anger and resentment that built up as a result of that, and he'll just announce that thing is in the past. You know, my friends, we must learn that under God's sovereignty, conflict is always an opportunity. Ken Sandy uses that expression quite a bit. In fact, he speaks about 1 Corinthians as a, as a detailed, detailed letter on conflict. Now, understand that conflict is not necessarily always bad or always destructive. You know, even when you know, conflict is caused by, by sinful behavior and causes a great deal of stress, God can still use it for good. God is sovereign. Think of Romans 8, 28 and 29. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and 11, 1, that, that what conflict does is conflict provides us with an opportunity um, to do several things, three significant opportunities. You know, by God's grace, here's what you can do with conflict. You know, when you think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and, and 1, 11, uh, 11, 1 rather, um, here's what you can do with conflict. Conflict can be used to glorify God. You know, how can you be trusting God? How can you be putting your faith in Him? How can you be imitating Him? You see, that brings glory to Him, obeying Him. <coughs> Excuse me, we can use conflict to serve other people by helping them, by, um, by, by, by helping to bear their burdens or by confronting them in love. Sometimes the most loving thing that you can do is to confront a person about their wrongdoing, by helping them to point out their sin. And then thirdly, Conflict can be used to help us to grow in Christ. You know, we confess our sin. We turn away from attitudes that promote conflict. Sandy speaks about the, the ABCs of conflict. You know, adversity building character. You know, the ABCs of Christian growth. Acknowledge, believe, confess. Acknowledge what the sin is. Believe that God is able to, to, to help you through that. Trust in the Lord and believe in His promises. Confess your shortcomings. And oftentimes, these concepts are often overlooked in, in conflict because we want to either escape the opportunity, escape the situation, or we want to overcome the opponent. There's a model that Sandy has, and I'm sorry I keep referring to Sandy, but he has a model where he speaks about the slippery slope of conflict resolution. And he has what is called, it's, it's sort of a, a half circle, and uh, on the one side he has what are called escape responses, and on the other side he has what is called attack responses. And then in the center, he has what is called the peacemaking responses. Now, the, now these, the attack responses are peace breaking. The, um, the escape responses are peace faking. And these are obviously where you run, where you uh, take on the silent treatment, where you pretend the issue is not really there. And those degenerate to a point where eventually it might result in the suicide of a person. They're self-destructive. 
On the other hand, you have the peace breaking. That is where there's argument and eventually there's, there's an altercation where there's an exchange of blows. And probably even, it might even begin with litigation. And so litigation leads to a breakdown in the relationship. And, and eventually it becomes physical. And finally, it might even result in somebody being murdered. Those are the attack responses. But he speaks about the peacekeeping responses that sit at the top of the slope. And you can see from the shape that that's the best place to be. Mediation, conversation, arbitration, you know, church discipline. They belong in the category of peacemaking. And we've got to strive towards doing that. Don't always seek to want to run away from the situation or to try and overcome the opponent. And so it's wise that periodically we step back from a conflict and we ask ourselves whether we're doing everything we can to take advantage of those opportunities. Here's something that you can know that when you think about the last time you had conflict in your household, that it's not a surprise to God. God is never surprised by your, your conflict situations. By the way, the, the sovereignty of God fits perfectly into a conversation at this particular point because that then reveals for us what it is in our lives that needs to change. It means that in conflict, we, we choose to the, the way of the new self. And I'm going to say something about that. We're going to get to verse 29 and 30 in a moment, but just have a look at the context there of verse 22 to 24. We're back in Ephesians. Now, why, why is this important for every believer? When you look at the contrast between verse 22 and 24, what are the two pictures you have here? In verse 22, you have the unsaved life. In verse 22, you have the saved life. Now, now when you read it, I'm not going to go through the text again, but you can do this on your own. You begin to look for the primary characteristic of the unsaved life, and you look for the primary characteristic of the saved life, or the believing life. Now look in verse 22. He says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the, the lust of deceit. What does all that mean? Well, it's oriented to one's feelings. You're guided by the way that you feel. Why did you do that? Well, I just felt like it. Just because I wanted to. You corrupted, uh, corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Why, why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? Well, I just didn't want to do it. I just didn't feel like it. That's the way that an unbelieving person behaves according to verse 22. Now look at the contrast in verse 24. He says, put on the new self. Now that's the opposite, which is the likeness of God which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So in other words, instead of living in a feeling-oriented way, he's saying God wants us to live in a principled way, in a truth-oriented way. In other words, don't live according to how your feelings feel, but live according to how what God's Word teaches us. You can't live by how you feel. You have to choose to live by the principles of Scripture. Otherwise, you end up saying the wrong thing, and your mouth speaks words that you should not speak. In fact, I don't know if you know how often we end up saying things that come out of our mouth long before our brains even catch up with it. Now just think back to the last time uh, you had a conflict situation and you acted on your feelings and you said what you were thinking and it simply just popped out of your mouth. Well, how did that end up? When you simply said things in the heat of the moment, how did that work out for you? And so you have to ask yourself this question. When there's a conflict, do you function in a feeling-oriented way or do you function in a truth-oriented way? And if that's the case, if you're functioning in a, a feeling-oriented way, what must you do? Well, you have to flee to the throne of grace. You get on your knees. You ask God's forgiveness. You, you don't forfeit the grace of God that's made available to you. You acknowledge to other people that, that you know what, I, I've blown it. I've messed up. I'm sorry. I've sinned. And you ask their forgiveness. Now, that's what we speak about, and that's the very heart of what resolves conflict. You need to begin to identify what are the areas in your life that need to change. Does anybody think that they even have a log in their eye when there's somebody in the family that's causing them offense? We don't see the log because we are so focused on trying to get the splinter out of their eye. You know, the language there is quite, quite explicit. It's as though you... You know, you read that passage and you think, what's wrong with us? How is it that we'll walk around with a plank in our eye and we're trying to focus on getting the splint out of somebody else's? We don't even know what's in them that has to change. But we want to go to them and point out their, their sin. We want to go to them and show them how they've wronged us. 
Have you ever noticed how deaf we become when we want to point out somebody else's sin? That we don't even hear or listen to what they have to say? Have you noticed that when somebody's trying to respond to us, that we shout louder than them, or we interject and we speak over them, and we actually don't listen to what they have to say? Have you noticed that when there's a family conflict, that there's some member of the family that says, but you're not listening to me? And sometimes that's our problem. We just don't listen. And we need to identify while they're trying to point, what is it in me that has to change? You know, we justify ourselves. We build up a, a defense response. And so in our conversation, all we want to do is show them how wrong they are. Well, Paul gives us something of a three-step process for change in this text. I mean, this book is just excellent. I love that. You can change. And so this is what he's telling us here in verse 24 through 22 to 24. I know some people say to me, you know, Neil, realistically... I've been around a long time. I've seen many conflicts. Uh, I don't really believe that we're capable of change. Uh, we're going to go through this, and I know we're going to go through it again. We're going to dance around this thing over and over and over again. And I'll often say to them, you know, that, uh, and, and you know, they'll, they'll say things to me like, you know, you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, we're not talking about dogs, and we're not talking about tricks here. And my answer to them always would be very emphatically, you can change. You can change. You know, the, the transforming power of the gospel is able to change us. Even makes the foulest sinner clean. And take them back to the gospel and show that. Well, here's, here's the principles. Now, this is not seven steps to wellness or five steps to wholeness or whatever those psychology programs are. But here's what the scripture simply teaches. Here's, look at verse 22. Paul says, you lay aside. There's certain things that you have to put off. You have to stop doing that thing. Here's what you must do. You have to put that thing to death. Put it off. The second step is in verse 23. 23, you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, you need to change the way you think about things. The way that you process it. Begin to look at it through the eyes of scripture. In verse 24, here's the third thing you must do. Put on a new self. So what's the point? In scripture, the way that we change is by putting off and putting on. It's not anything. There's no rocket science here. It's the simple principle of replacement in both the, the inner and the outer man so that we encourage folks to develop for themselves a way of identifying what is this thing that's hindering in my life. I would often give folks a piece of paper while they sit with me and say to them, write down, write it down there, put it down on this paper, think about that specific area and be very specific about it as you can. What's that one area in your life that needs to be changed? And then I'm going to speak to them about what we're going to be doing to change that. Get them to draw up a little chart for themselves. Let me use an example here. Maybe the person has the tendency to, to use harsh words. They struggle with a number of issues, and, and they can't control their speech, and so they speak harshly. They, they use harsh terms, and, and maybe harsh terms has gotten you into trouble a little bit more than once. You know, the mouth speaks, and the brain is to catch up. Now, now, in order to change the use of harsh speech, you must first identify it. You must first begin to know what it is. What is this thing? Sit back, turn your cell phone, or switch off the television, and sit and think it through. What are the patterns of thinking that I have that lead to hard speech, uh, uh, to harsh speech? What are the, what are the desires uh, in my heart? What are, the, what are the things that's going on in my heart? What are my attitudes, my, my selfishnesses, you know, the idols that I'm feeding? What are the things that I think satisfy me that feeds why I am upset that I haven't had my way? And so I express myself in that way. You know, what is it that leads to that? What's the behavior that I have? What manipulating conduct am I using to get my way? Write that very thing down. Identify it. And then you're going to decide with the help of God, and you say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that thing to death. I'm going to stop that, and I'm going to replace it with the opposite. I'm going to take off that behavior, and I'm going to put on a different behavior. I'm going to do the opposite of that. Identify it, name it for what it is, and then determine to put that behavior off and then put a good behavior in its place. 
Somebody said to me one day, well, Neil, when, when does a liar stop being a liar? When does somebody who tells lies stop being a, an untruth teller? And I don't want to use soft words like that. He's, the Bible calls it lies. So when does a liar stop being a liar? Well, what must he do? Identify, that's my problem. I am unable to tell the truth. I'm always telling lies. And so put off lying. Well, Paul tells us what we must put on in its place, isn't it? You can't simply put off lying because you're not fully recovered yet. You now have to put on a different set of clothing, and that clothing is put on truth-telling, determined to tell the truth. You know how often I had a friend of mine share testimony one day. He was preparing to go to Namibia, and he shared a testimony with the congregation, and, and he came home, and then he came straight to my place. He came in crying. He said, Neil, I can't believe it, but in my sharing... I embellished a tiny bit of detail like this in the testimony, and I've, I've told a lie. I've told a lie. I said, well, that's a good start. So confess the lie, and then what must you do? I said, immediately bring the corrective measure. What is the truth behind what you needed to communicate? And you put truth-telling into its place. And you can apply that to, to every debilitating, sinful, bad habit that we have. A man, is, a man is a pornographer. When does he stop being a pornographer? Well, when he puts off watching pornography. And you put all kinds of things in place. Well, well, is that all that needs to be done? No, he's going to put on a different behavior in its place. <clears throat> what is he doing? He's lusting after other women. He's lusting after other images. What should he be doing? He should be loving his wife. And so what is the behavior you put in its place? Put off that rotten behavior, and put on a good behavior where you're loving your wife and you're cherishing her and, you, and you're honoring her and you're treating her as, she, as, as, as your wife, treat her as she, as she ought to be treated. Replace it with the opposite thing. And so, and so again, just take that harsh speech as an example. What's the, what's the thought process behind why I use harsh words? And of course, if you, you, know, if you say... Um, you know, I, I haven't had the time to think through it. There's, and I want to say to you, there's no magic wands. There's no snapping of fingers. It doesn't just go away. But Christians ought to be people who sit down and become thoughtful about their behavior. There's a different part for us to play, and it's very, very deliberate. Sure, our time is pretty much gone, isn't it? How long is this session? Anybody know? Two, two quarter past. And it's just gone quarter past. Well, how do I wrap this up? I think we need to ask ourselves in a time of, of conflict, we must ask ourselves the question, what is it that we want? You know, some of us are, you know, for, for some of us, we just want to be mean. We just want to be that guy. We want to be the person that hurts other people because I'm hurting, you know, um, well, 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 why do you, what do you need to do with that desire when you simply want to be mean? You need to crucify it. I don't know if you've ever seen the progression of an idol. You, you see something, you desire it, you want it, you demand it, and then you punish when you don't have it. So you see something, that's not a bad thing, but when you see something, now you want to have it. And you know what it's like. Television commercials are like that. They draw us in. And before long, you start desiring a thing that you don't need. You're going to spend money on something you don't need, money that you don't have, for people that you don't want to really give it to anyway. But now you desire it. And the next thing you say is you don't only desire it, but I've got to have it. And you'll want to have it at all costs. I want it. And when you want it, you start to demand it. Honey, you need to see that you put some money aside in our budget. I've got to have that thing. And so when she doesn't give you that thing, what do you do? Well, you punish her for not giving you your way. That's an idol. And oftentimes, those things that, that we progress to so easily, and we need to put that to death, replace it with what's right, and turn around and say, and you make yourself a little card that says, I want to please God. I do this with myself all the time. I have a number of little ledger cards that I keep, and they have various things on them. And one of them would be, I, I, I want to please God. Um, there's another one that says, I'm only going to use right language. Uh, I think about, use only wholesome words. And as soon as I, I find that the heat is rising, I go for my ledger card and I hold it in front of me. Honey, I'm looking at you now and I want to please God. And we'll take a time. We'll simply have what we call a grace break. 
and we take our grace breaks and we pause and I, at some point when the heat gets too high, we take a break and we go back and we say, let's approach the throne of God with boldness for it's there that we find mercy in times of need. I know I've opened up a whole can of worms for you here today, but we spoke about words that tear down, uh, we've spoken about attitudes, we spoke about how um, there's a need for our own, for our, for our selfishnesses to be satisfied, but there's nothing more wonderful than to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. And I think there's the way that we resolve conflicts in our home is to give up our rights to a thing. Something that we've learned to do over the years, and we still work at it all the time because we just don't get it right all the time, is that we take those times where we sit down and we say, honey, help me identify what is it that I've done that has contributed to this conflict? Have I said a word? Help me identify those words that have hurt you, that are displeasing to you. And I determine that as I look at my own little ledger cards, I will let no unwholesome speech come out of my mouth. And I will determine to love and to nurture and to grow and to protect. There's much more we could say. I wanted to look at a passage in James, but we can leave that for now. And I really wanted to speak about just the power of, of conflict resolution. And there's great power when we come to the cross. There's great power in trusting the Spirit of God. And it's interesting how Paul ends that passage. Don't grieve the Spirit of God. Not to avail yourself of that opportunity. To be, to, be, to, be, to be grown through, through the conflict is to ignore the grace of God. It's to grieve the Spirit of God. And so we need to avail ourselves of that. Paul says, even when he pleaded for that thorn to be removed from his flesh, he understood that God's grace was sufficient for him. I want to say to you, grace will see you through. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I know that we haven't covered all that we wanted to. But I just pray that in some practical way, you help us to think about um, how we can change. Uh, thank you for the powerful and very practical nature of your word. Uh, thank you for the cross and for um, the fact that we need the power and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ to be able to handle our conflicts well. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us now to acknowledge our need and to continually place our faith and our trust in you. Lord, for more many of us, I know we need to simply spend time praying to you, coming to the throne of grace and, and just confessing our wrong habits during the conflicts that we face. And I pray that we do that, habits of the heart, habits of the mouth. Lord, we need to go to our loved ones and confess that we, that we wrong them, that we need to ask for forgiveness to a husband, a wife, a child. Lord, whatever it is that you would have us do, that by the power that you give us through your spirit, help us to take the next step. And teach us, Father, how to put off those bad behaviors, how to put off that, those, those habit patterns that so are ingrained in our sinful nature. And help us to put on a different clothing. Help us to put on rightness. Help us to put on good speech. Help us to put on good behavior. Help us to put on loving attitudes. And we thank you again that it's possible for each one of us to pray as we commit our families to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being patient with me. Hi, my name is Dr. John Street. I'm a professor at the Masters University and Seminary, and I'm also the president of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors here in the United States. Uh, I'm very familiar with Strengthening Ministries and the wonderful program that they have, not just in terms of Bible training, but in taking good biblical theology and using it very practically for counseling purposes. If you're interested in a program like this, this is the kind of a program that will not just impact your life educationally, it will affect the rest of your life, the way in which you live. In fact, there are numerous people that I know who have gone through a program and at the end of it, they say, wow, 
you know, I went into this program to help other people, but it ended up helping me. And I think that you're going to find that to be true in the strengthening ministries training program that you take.